All right. Well, actually, but unless you turned in at the you know twenty minutes till you didn't hear the first uh, version of uh, somebody bigger than you and I was by Mahalia Jackson. It's it's a standard gospel uh, song, and then you know uh, Whitney Houston revs it up there. Great uh, version of it. Elvis even cut this song. You should listen to Elvis sing "Somebody Bigger Than You and I." It's quite a it's quite a revelation. But but that's I think we got to get into that frame of mind if you're going to deal with these these emotions that are often uh, bigger than you and I. Uh, and I really want to you know when I was ask you know asking uh, not everybody is comfortable when somebody says could you pray for this, so I want to just talk about prayer a little bit. You, you don't need to be religious. You don't even need to believe in God to pray. I hope you know that. Um, uh, you need uh, the intention of communing with something bigger than you and I. You can call it what you will. Uh, the 12 steps uh, guys know that they need something bigger than their own ego to deal with whatever addiction brings them to a 12 step meeting. And that's, you know, uh, Bill W called it the higher power. It could be the bigger power. It could be the deeper power, but you gotta have something uh, bigger than your ego to manage some things in life. And certainly to grieve losses, to deal with despair, to even understand despair. Uh, uh, and then also to deal with the fear. They're all, they have benefits. Those things are not mistakes. They're not things to be gotten rid of. That's very much uh, Miriam Greenspan's uh, take on it and my take on it too. So there's benefits to be gained if you can learn how to grieve, how to deal with despair, how to actually feel and, work and go through that emotion of despair. Same with fear. Uh, there's positive benefits and graces involved. Uh, and then there's the opposite. If we just do whatever we can to avoid them or get rid of them or whatever, we think we can, you can, you can. And so it takes, um, takes a community like this. And so hopefully this community doing this work for the next four months will help you out. Anybody who's in, uh, you know, a 12 step thing knows the power of the community. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I had the, the heart, uh, I love that uh, screensaver. It's the heart's all cracked open and you can see the light coming out of it. Uh, the heart is something bigger than you and I. When we talk about the heart, we're not talking about the physical heart, which is all jammed up for my, for my brother-in-law, Jim, but uh, we're talking about this um, level of consciousness that can integrate the best of the body and the mind. And it's, it's a kind of amazing thing. And it's, that's what we we're calling upon. And another definition of prayer is, it's a kind of utterance just straight from the heart into the universe. It can be out loud or whatever, but sometimes it's just help. You know, say the word help. When, uh, when I first heard about uh, my brother-in-law on top of my sister, I just came in here and just sort of fell apart on the cushion and, and uh, it was just like help, you know. You don't need to believe in God or even be religious to be in need of help at some time. And hopefully this community is a help to you all the time. But just uh, that's prayer. It's prayer to show up for this thing. It's prayer to add your presence to this mix, you see. So, but it's really sort of something that comes straight from the heart out to whatever is bigger than you and I. And there better be something bigger than my ego. Otherwise, I'm really in trouble. And, I have been in that kind of trouble. I'll, I'll do a poem about that today. Uh, he, Alan Watts is one of my favorite, uh, uh, one of my favorite wisdom figures. He, his, his autobiography was called In My Own Way. And if that cuts both sides, he was very unique and he did things in his own way, but he also got in his own way, which, you know, that's what the ego does. And so the way prayer is, is somehow moving that out for a moment and to, to allow something bigger to come into play. If you can make it through on your ego power for years, but um, then you'll hit the point where you can. The way uh, Jared and 
and uh, his wife sees was here and we watched uh, rewatched it for me it was rewatching the bio of biopic on aretha franklin jennifer hudson plays aretha aretha hit bottom you know talent as it can be golden records all over the wall and she was on the floor booze bottles all around her she hit bottom because it was she she had a lot of hard things happen in her life and at some point the ego can't manage it all the sooner the better actually because then you gotta and you know there's a great scene if you haven't seen that movie you should see it. it's just called aretha it's it's out you can see it for free if you're on cable it's worth seeing jennifer hudson's great and aretha's you know the, the subject's even greater uh, but she at, at that point she just didn't even know how to pray and uh the grace came came in she just asked for help asked for help you yeah. know so so at least at least entertain that idea because well uh when i asked somebody to uh, pray for jim he said well I'll, I'll keep him in my thoughts and i i thought well okay i'll, I'll take anything but I mean, it's people feel like, oh, well, I'm not religious, I can't pray, or I don't believe in God, I can't pray. Don't buy that. It's just asking for something bigger than you and I for help. And we're all gonna need it sometimes. So you gotta get good at it right now, okay? Uh, this, uh, you know, Rumi, who was in the back in the 13th century is, is as expansive a person that can be, uh, but he didn't get there on his own. He lost Shams, who was his beloved, you know, uh, well, the guy who was waiting for his whole life. He disappeared, and then he was probably killed. He dropped out of his life, so lost him for good. And um, Rumi couldn't deal with it. Rumi's ego couldn't deal with it. And he, he just went to the mosque. He was the head of he was the imam, but he just went to the mosque and grabbed onto one of the pillars and started walking around and weeping and then yelling out grief lines about grief and it was the only thing that holding on to the pillar this kind of physical contact holding on to the pillar and circling it walking in circles around it uh, was the only thing that gave him just enough um uh soothing of the grief to where he could start to work with it and uh in greenspan's book uh she has a great she has a couple great sections on how you have to these emotions are so intense that they're too intense to work with so you have to do some soothing things to actually be able to even work with it and and so when you read the book the advantage of the book is it's got some great practices for soothing say intense grief now this poem i'm going to read was uh, oh oh yeah i was gonna i'm gonna give you some long-term homework if you want it um sometime uh, just sit down and reflect on your life. Don't have to do it today, uh, but reflect on your life and look for the five greatest losses in your life. Uh, when I would do this with people in session, I'd have them trace their hand, you know, like we used to do when we were doing the like what at Thanksgiving or you know, kids trace their hand, they make the turkey out of it. But you can just trace your hand sometimes. Somehow that's a really interesting way to do it. And then you got the five fingers and uh, the five greatest losses in your life you might have never thought about that and to then reflect on it and i'm going to talk about uh, the first two greatest losses in my life at least as of now you know life keeps going you know and uh, you never know what's coming next uh but i'm gonna this poem's about the first two greatest losses in my life the second greatest loss in my life was when my marriage fell apart the first time uh, that would be back in 1980. And, uh, you know, to, to, my eyes are starting to tear up. Just think about all the pain that uh, was involved in that and just the loss of that. I was actually, you know, I was out of the house. And uh, now the first greatest loss is the second time that happened. And, uh, and I realized that I hadn't grieved the first one. And so I'm making the same mistakes, another version of it, another version of it. Uh, but the, you know, so there was a lot to grieve. The fact that I hadn't grieved the first one, really. We'd gone into counseling, we'd sort of patched things up, 
but I'd never really grieved it. And that came back to haunt me. And that's one of the rules of grief. Grief deferred doesn't go anywhere. Actually, you haven't learned what you need to learn because there's learning with each loss. And um, there's a, you're going on, you're not the same. You know, you're different, you're wiser. Rumi is the master of talking about the wisdom of grief and the guidance of grief that is fully grieved. So this is a poem that came out of uh, the second time uh, that the marriage fell apart. And uh, it, it, like Rumi, he, he rotated around the pillar. That's where the whirling dervishes came from, by the way. But um, uh, for me, um, I did my grief on the road, walking this two kilometer road to the to the end of the dead end at the forest and back. And uh, this is a poem about that. And uh, maybe it will help you see you can, you, you know, you can do anything for grief. Uh, it took me two years and two pairs of Chaco boots to grieve my last big loss. That's $200 in shoe leather for 600 hours and a thousand miles of therapy. That same $200 might have gotten me into one, maybe two 45 minute sessions with a therapist. And I'm not knocking traditional therapy at all. Our six months with a therapist in Houston resurrected our marriage for the first time. But the last time I hurt the ones I loved it was two years of what I call shoe leather therapy that healed me. So depending on what you need to grieve and where you are in your life, if you can, trust the winding road with your losses. Walk and weep, stop and start, pray or cuss for as long as it takes to turn grievance into gratitude in your brokenness into a peaceful wholeheartedness. Yeah, it, it took me two years on the, the last one because, uh, well, to lose it again. I mean, the fact that we are here in this moment and whatever grace you've gotten out of uh, any of these sessions, it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't agreed that. I probably wouldn't be here. No doubt, because this is, you know, loose leaf hollow is, is as much Pam's work as mine. And so that's, it's a hard poem to read, but I think it's helpful because for one thing, you know, you, whatever you do, that is your way of grieving. It could be walking, it could be road trading around a pillar, it could be just sitting in nature, it could be, you know, done on the cushion. All of those things were happening really for me. But um, somehow walking on the road, uh, it, it, it was when I could really grieve. And I wasn't grieving alone because I, I walked this road for now 40 years and the trees were familiar. As a matter of fact, my current spiritual director, and director is a poplar tree on the way. So I stopped every time during those two years and just stood in front of her and uh, and just uh, got what wisdom she had for me and the birds, the animals. I mean, the, this when I walk this road, I'm walking into another community here and it's dangerous to try to do this work alone. And that's that's what happens. You do what you try to isolate. And, uh, and it takes companionship to work with any of these dark emotions. It takes a community, but at least one person, one other person would be nice, you know, uh, and oftentimes we push people away, especially during, well, any of these, any of these things, the ego just is isolated. So to let people help you through it, it it's key. And I, I, you know, I didn't know that. I had to learn that. I had to learn that. I learned it really that second time. So um, the book is really helpful, but more of the commitment and the uh, the sense of 
yeah, this is how this is how uh, you become what Merton called the true self. The true self is much bigger than you and I. You know, it's bigger than the ego, and um, it takes shattering experiences in a way to break up the ego enough so that you can expand. Again, remember the ego wants to make everything smaller and controllable, and the soul wants to expand. So you have this kind of thing going on all the time. It's a bit like the heart, love dub, love dub. It's just the human journey. But to realize that these shattering experiences, um, they break you up. Remember the, the heart, it's broken. Uh, uh, Greenspan, in, in the introduction to the grief section, she quotes the mad rabbi of Kotz, Menachem Mendel, who was, although I could talk for the rest of the time about stories about this guy, he's called the mad rabbi of Kotz in, in Poland, but he said that there isn't anything wholer, there isn't anything more whole than a broken heart. And so that's the reason these things happen. To break us open and so that we can expand. I mean, one last thing before we, we can sit with all this and ponder this is, you know, you got to lose the idea of closure. It's total baloney. You know, we, you know, psychiatry, you know, the DSM manual used to have, all right, six months of, of being in pieces after a big loss, that's okay. But after six months, that's morbid grief. Well, that's ridiculous. By any, but now it's down to two months. Got to do this quicker got to do this quicker or it's more of a degree if you, you risk going into depression, whatever that is. And, uh, you know, then they'll define that too, but it's nonsense. We're living in a culture that wants, expects everything quick and painless. And it, it not how a human beings transform. It just isn't. It just isn't. You think of the greats, <laughs> watch Aretha. She had to go through, uh, the darkness, uh, and to see that the light was in the darkness and the darkness is in the light, that's a whole life. That's the yin and yang of it, you see. We only want the light. It's going to get dark. You know, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's enough to, to ponder today. And again, the book is, if you haven't, uh, you're just picking up on it this first time, it's uh, Healing Through the Dark Emotions, Miriam Greenspan. She wrote it right after 9-11, so there's a lot of copies uh, uh, available like used. You can get the book for be the best five or six dollars you ever spent to have that book. Even if you're not ready to read it now, get it, put it on the shelf. You can even, even look at the practices in back if you want. You could cheat. You could, you could, you could read it any way you want. It, uh, any paragraph would be uh, helpful to you. All right. Well, I think that's, that's enough to ponder. Yeah, remember, take that. Remember that... Uh, long-term homework at some point sit down and actually put pen to paper and just come up with the five biggest losses today and it doesn't mean that necessarily just a loss of, of soul life somebody died it could be a relationship thing like a uh and i actually none of my top five are have to do with individual deaths grievous as they were uh, they're, they're more about relationships. Um, so uh, put that on paper and then ask yourself, have I, you'll go through it. Have I grieved that fully? You'll know. You'll know that that's a really good mindfulness practice. Okay, so let's, we'll switch over to, uh, to uh, sitting mode. <laughs> 